So in our Strangest Animals Part 1 and Part 2 videos, we've talked about some really well-hidden frogs and bugs. We've talked about lizards with blue tongues and long tongues. How many more weird animals could I possibly have? Well, today, one of the animals we're talking about is probably the strangest animal that I have, and it's not even a reptile. When you're done with this video, make sure you go back and watch part one and part two of this series where we talk about tegus, axolotls, I have blue tongue skink, hedgehog, chinchilla, a bunch of different animals. I have a lot of weird animals, but it makes for some really fun videos. First up is probably my most intimidating looking animal, even though it's really not that big right now. And it kind of looks like a demonic spider crab hybrid. And even though this animal looks kind of scary, it's actually completely harmless. In fact, the tailless whip scorpion looks so much like a demonic little creature that its scientific name loosely translates to the devil's crown. Now, most whip scorpions, like the vinegaroon that we get here in the southeastern United States, they have a very thin kind of whip-like tail, which is where they get their name. This one, though, is a tailless whip scorpion, so it doesn't have that. It's just got a blunt end. Just in our last video with the Asian forest scorpion spotlight, we talked about how they have these weird chelicerae or the little mouth appendages that help with feeding. And they also have their pedipalps or the pinchers. And we also talked about how they have 10 limbs total with eight of those being their actual legs and two being the pinchers. Now this invertebrate has 10 limbs still, but they're a little bit stranger than the normal scorpions. So it still has eight legs, except the front two pair, and you might be able to see it on the camera right now, aren't for walking, they're actually sensory. They're very, very, very thin, and they use those to feel around. It's very, very fast, by the way. So they use these to feel around when moving or hunting. So they don't have eight legs for walking. And right here at the front of the mouth, just like a scorpion, they have pinchers, but unlike the Asian forest scorpion, which are really, really big meaty pinchers, theirs are like little barbed claws. And an important difference between this and your other scorpions and spiders is they don't have venom, they don't have a delivery system, they don't have the stinger of scorpions, they don't have fangs like spiders and tarantulas, they have none of that. This animal is completely harmless to us. It does have those little barbed claws, but this, I feed it crickets a couple times a week. So what it does, just like a scorpion, is it grabs the cricket, it brings it into its mouth, and it doesn't have any fangs or anything like that. It's just kind of got like an oral cavity like what a scorpion does. So it can't bite you, it can't sting you, it can't envenomate you, it really has no defense other than running away and hiding in a very tight narrow hidey hole or something like that because this animal is very very fast that's why I'm not putting it in my hand I'm not putting it on the table it is very very fast and because they are such a flat animal they can hide in very very tight spaces and I was told by the breeder when I bought this little whip scorpion that you can't keep it on like normal wood or bark or anything like that because their feet are very very sensitive and it'll actually hurt their feet the little hooks on it so the best thing to do is to keep them in something like a cereal container drill some some holes in it put some water in there and then give them a nice big kind of piece of styrofoam that they can climb and scuttle around on and that is all they need so they have very very sensitive little feet Ooh, there you go so I thought we'd start this video out with a kind of spooky invertebrate, just like we did the last two videos. Why don't we move on to another animal from Africa but one that is a lot bigger than this little guy this is Drax the Destroyer. He's my African giant bullfrog, also called a pixie frog because of their scientific name. But as you can see, there's nothing really pixie about this dude. He's a pretty big frog. Now, this is actually one of the world's largest frog species. And they're also the largest frog that you can commonly find in captivity as a pet. I mean, the Pac-Man frogs don't get nearly this big because he's actually on the smaller end, but we'll talk about that. But Pac-Man frogs don't get quite this big, but they are probably more common than pixie frogs. They have a very rotund kind of Jabba the Hutt looking body shape and the males can grow to be over four pounds and almost a foot long. Drax here is about two and a half pounds and when I got him he was the size of my fingernail and only weighed a couple grams if that. All frogs have teeth per se. They're not like our teeth or crocodile teeth or dog teeth. It's basically a very thin row of very very small teeth on the upper jaw. You, if they were to bite you you really don't feel this. These guys on the other hand are one of the only a handful of frog species that have I guess you could say 
say, more normal-like teeth. They have these three little bony tube-like projections on their lower jaw called odontoids. And because of these and their size, they can actually go after some fairly big vertebrate prey like snakes, rats, other frogs, lizards, small birds, etc. In most reptiles and amphibians, there's little to no parental care. Usually the babies are either on their own or in a few specific cases, like a lot of crocodilian species, mom might do some defending with the babies. In this species, however, dad is the one doing all the heavy lifting. Mom will lay three to 4,000 eggs and then she dips. That's it, she's not looking after the babies anymore. And these eggs, these tadpoles are actually kind of weird because most tadpoles usually hatch in a, a week or two, maybe three weeks. But for this species, they hatch out, out of the egg in usually a day or two, sometimes three. These eggs are usually laid in like a little vernal pool or temporary water source. And dad will look over the eggs to try and deter predators as best he can. Now, when this water source starts kind of drying up, dad will actually take his big, strong back legs, like he's trying to show off right now. There you go. He takes these big, strong back legs and he'll actually dig a little channel from that water source to a larger, more permanent water source, like a pond or a lake or something like that. And that way the tadpoles can swim through and get into the bigger water source and don't risk dying. Now, he's not exactly dad of the year because through this entire process, he might snack on a few hundred of the babies, but you know, less mouths to feed, so whatever. They usually spend equal amounts of time in and out of the water and they'll sometimes go into like a deep hibernate. Oh, that was rude. <laughs> All right. As I was saying, when it gets dry, they'll go into this kind of hibernation-like state burrowing underground, and they can remain in that for sometimes up to 10 months, better part of a year until the rainy season when they'll emerge again. The males will develop this reddish-orange armpit to help attract a mate, and they'll actually develop extra padding on their front feet when it's time to, um... So for the first snake on one of these videos, the eastern indigo snake isn't really that strange compared to some of America's weirdest animals like the nine banded armadillo which we go over in this top five right here but it is definitely one of my strangest snakes they have a very unusual coloration with in this lighting she probably looks solid black with this bright red orangey face right there but if i took her outside she would have a very very striking vivid blue sheen to her entire body which is kind of where they get their name it is the longest snake native to the united states longer than any rattlesnake species rat snakes racers any of those now it's not not as long obviously as like the Burmese python, but that's why I'm saying native snakes. Callie here is obviously not fully grown. She's gonna get bigger than this. The females usually max out somewhere in like the five to six foot mark, whereas males can get up to over eight feet long. Unlike a lot of other non-venomous snakes though, especially a lot of your North American non-venomous snakes, like a lot of your colubrids, like corn snakes, rat snakes, racers, etc., they're not primarily rodent eaters. They'll eat just about anything that fits in their mouth because this is a fairly big snake. So they'll eat invertebrates, they'll eat snakes, lizards, frogs, birds, fish, other mammals, basically just about anything. It's like a garbage dump of a snake. They are immune to snake venom, just like the Florida king snake, which we talked about in this animal spotlight right here. And that means they have very few in the way of reptilian predators to worry about. Maybe some smaller alligators and some invasive tegus or something. But outside of that, because they are the really longest, biggest, non-venomous snake you're gonna find here in the States, especially down in Florida where they're from. And because they're immune to copperhead, water moccasin, rattlesnake venom, they don't have to worry about them really. This is actually the only animal that I own that actually requires me to have a license to use it in my programs. In New York, Eastern Indigos cannot be owned as pets. And I have a license through the DEC that I have to renew every year to use it in my education programs because this is a federally threatened species. Historically, they were found in several states in the South, but now they're only found in a few pockets in Florida Florida and maybe southern Georgia. This is hands down one of the most visually stunning reptiles that I have. It was at the top of my reptile dream list for a very, very long time. So I was very fortunate when I actually met a breeder in New York State that I could buy it from because I can't buy it from across straight lines. So I was very happy to add her to my little education family. I think the legless lizard is one of the textbook examples of a really strange, weird reptile. Is it a snake? Is it a lizard? The world may never know. No. That, that's wrong. It, it knows. We know it's a lizard. It's 100% a lizard. Now, we talked before about skinks on the channel. In fact, in my very first video, we talked about Big Lou, my blue tongue skink. Skinks are kind of like a snake-like lizard. For the most part, they're, they have got an elongated body with smaller legs. Legless lizards are a step past that, where they don't have legs anymore. A couple species still have like little nubs from where their back legs used to be, evolutionarily speaking. But for the most part, they're all legless and they're kind of slithering around on the ground, kind of like a snake. And there are quite a few differences between 
between snakes and legless lizards that we're going to go over. First up is one of the biggest ones is their eyelids. Legless lizards have eyelids, whereas snakes don't. Snakes have a clear scale that goes over the eye. So when they shed their skin, you can actually see that eye scale on the shed. These guys don't have that. They have eyelids. So when these guys shed their skin, you're just going to see the eyelid as if it was a tegu shed or an iguana shed. So if it blinks, it's a lizard. Also, they have an external ear hole that snakes lack. Now, I hear all the time that snakes don't have ears, they can't hear, etc. But that we'll talk about in another video. But that's all wrong. Snakes do have ears. They just don't, they're not like ours. They don't have this ear hole right here like most mammals do, birds have, most reptiles have. They also have a much, much more rigid body than a snake does. So these guys have the same scales going all the way around the body. Whereas a snake, you have the smaller back scales. And then on the belly, you have those wide, almost rectangular belly scales that help them get traction on the ground when they move in that S motion. Legless lizards don't have that. They are much more restricted in their range of motion. If you put them out on the ground, they can get along pretty well, but on a flat, smooth surface, they have a much, much harder time than a snake would. Legless lizards also don't have the ability to constrict their food like most non-venomous snakes do as well. Now this one kind of depends on the species you're talking about, but at least for the legless lizard that I have, the European legless lizard, they have rounded teeth because in the wild they're going to be eating a lot of invertebrates like snails and crickets and things like that. Whereas snakes typically have very thin but fairly sharp teeth because they're going to be using those to grip onto their food, whether it's frogs, lizards, rats, birds, whatever. Another difference is their internal anatomy. Now, snakes and lizards both have a cloaca or a vent. And on legless lizards and snakes, at least, this is kind of like a trap door scale on the underside that'll open up and the poop comes out. This is the end of the body and where the tail begins. This is where all their organs end. On a snake, the vent is usually somewhere down here where my fingers are, somewhere roughly there, towards way more towards one end of the body. So this is all going to be body right here. And this last six to 10 inches or so is usually usually the tail and the poop will come out right there. On a legless lizard, however, the vent is right there where my thumb is. So this guy is literally just about 50% body and 50% tail. He's about half and a half. So all the organs are in this half of the body and this is all just tail. And just like a lot of lizards can do when they're scared, they can actually pop their tail off like geckos, iguanas, etc. So they're gonna drop the tail right there where my finger is. They're gonna drop this. This will all come off and wiggle and he'll slow their way while the predator is distracted by that. And it will take a few months for him to grow a new tail. So it'll kind of look like a, I don't know, a weird hot dog for that time. And there's actually several legless lizard species that that tail not only breaks off, but the tail itself will break into multiple pieces where they get the nickname glass lizard. So instead of just one big tail wiggling around, you'll have like five or six little bits of tail kind of all vibrating around distracting the predator. Legless lizards also have this lateral fold going down the body that basically acts like you buckling your belt or undoing your pants button at Thanksgiving if you eat too much. So in captivity, if you have a legless lizard that never shows that, it's just a very round legless lizard, that legless lizard is most likely obese. Now we get to what is probably the strangest animal of all the animals that I have. And she's also the only animal that kind of shares like the common living space with us outside my dog and my cat because the reptiles are all downstairs and the mammals are in a side room right here. This is Pepper and she's my African gray parrot. Pepper, give me a kiss. Good girl. So there are two different kinds of African gray parrots. The one that most people usually picture is the Congo African gray, which is a very, very light gray, a bright red tail, and they're also larger. Pepper here is called a Timna African gray, and they are smaller, much darker gray. They have a mixed color beak, and they have more of a maroon tail. It's not as bright. Hey, yo, give me a kiss. Good girl. African greys are one of the smartest non-primate animals on the planet. There was an African grey that passed away a few years ago that they used in scientific research. His name was Alex. Unless they poop on the table. Anyways, his name was Alex and they used him in a bunch of different research and studies on bird intelligence and he knew something like 4,000 words and could solve a bunch of complex puzzles with shapes and colors and matching. Pepper isn't quite that skilled. She knows about 20 or so words that she can say solidly and I hear her say every once in a while, some more frequently than others. And she knows a bunch of sounds. She knows my dog barking, my cat meowing, the sound of my Xbox turning on, the microwave buttons, the smoke alarm, my dog squeak toys. You know a bunch of different sounds, huh? You want know cracker? Pepper say cracker. Cracker. Good girl. Pepper say peekaboo. 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 There you go. 
And when these birds make their sounds, they're not using vocal cords like we do. Any bird that has like the ability to quote unquote speak, like ravens, crows, etc., they have a special part of the brain devoted to learning and mimicking vocal sounds. In parrots, however, this area actually has two different parts to it compared to the other birds like singular part. And in the wild, these birds will use this ability to learn calls and sounds and stuff to learn the calls of other African greys in their flock, either as they're growing up or as they're trying to join a new flock. And these African greys, they'll actually have regional dialects where one flock of African greys in their home range will sound very different from another group in that same range. Parrots make these sounds by controlling the airflow over their syrinx, which is an organ right where the trachea meets the lungs. And parrots also have really weird feet. They have two toes on each side, and that's basically like a fully functioning little hand. So if I give her like a cracker or a grape or something, she'll hold onto it while she takes chomps out of it. She can use it to kind of scritch herself. She can reach her neck. She'll bend her head down just kind of like that. She'll scritch herself. She can also use it to hold on to tools and things, help climb her bars of her cage and things like that. I could go on and on about how weird parrots are. They're basically a mini three-year-old with a very strong weapon attached to their face that they can do a lot of damage with. In my kitchen, I have an island and uh, she's basically destroyed the entire underside of the wood down there because she just loves chewing on it. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And she's also dug holes in my closet door so she can hook her beak right up underneath it, open it and go in so she can not even get to any of the food. She just loves destroying a hole in my recycling bin. My, re my old recycling bin had a massive hole in it just from her strong beak taking chunks out of it. So parrots have very, very strong beaks, especially your big macaws, like your hyacinth macaw. That thing can probably bend steel. I wouldn't be surprised. But Pepper has what is probably the weirdest story of how I got them of any of my animals. A couple years ago, there was a family having a pool put in their backyard and the construction company, they were putting the pool, the pool in and then they went back out to their truck and they left their tool chest open in their truck bed. And her favorite game to play is she'll take things on the counter like pens or like spoons or whatever and she'll drop them on the floor and she'll look at it and she loves the sound and everything of it clanking against the floor. So these guys came back out to their truck and they just heard this weird clanking sound from their truck and they're like, what is that? And they go over and they look in their truck bed and out of nowhere, this is about an hour south of where I am in New York, there was just a parrot in their back in the back of their truck just taking their tools out of the tool chest and dropping them into the truck bed so they're like where did this bird come from so they called animal control and she just stepped right up onto their hands she was super friendly she loves people yes she does whereas african greys usually tend to be kind of picky with their people she loves everyone i'll have kids at shows holder volunteers she loves everyone except for sitting on camera with me. But anyways, so then she went to animal control and then she went to a parrot rescue where I'm friends with the owners with. And they had her for about, probably about five or so months until I came to a doctor and they've got contacts like all over. She just flew to the floor. <laughs> they got contacts everywhere. So they were looking for an owner for it because Tim the African greys are fairly uncommon, but the band on her leg didn't match anything. They couldn't find vets or breeders or anything. So they had her for about five or six months and then they adopted her out to me to use in my programs. Now she is a very skilled flyer, so she could have flown from anywhere. This was in July, so we had quite a few months of warmth. So she could have flew from, I don't even know, California, Florida, I have no idea. But she just showed up in the backyard in kind of Southern New York, and uh, she's been with me ever since. So that was part three of five of our strangest animals. So we've gone through 15 animals and I have over 70. So I've got a few other strange animals to talk about. We'll probably save that for next Halloween. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Like the video if you learned something. Comment down below which of the five animals I talked about today was your favorite. And if you're going out for trick-or-treating this year or doing anything Halloween related, just be smart, be safe, please be careful. Thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you later.